So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, today is uh, October 26, and I thought, you know, since I'm here on Thursday morning, and uh, I see that there have been questions from time to time uh, from students when they want to ask about either a certain job or aspects of market. Maybe I can try to do just a little bit to help you guys uh, and try and make a difference. And uh, so the the idea is that you can ask me anything that you want. Uh, I prefer you to ask me things that are outside of your course. Uh, otherwise, this just becomes another tutorial and we don't need that. Uh, so you can ask me anything about markets that you want to know. Uh, you can ask me anything about um, a particular job function or you know different lines of work. Now I don't know all the I don't know all the job functions. I know I know some of them. I think since my my career was quite diverse, I I, I should be able to tell you you know quite reasonably uh, what a fund manager does. What a hedge fund does, uh, what a trading person or sales or analyst or risk management, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and I want to I just, uh, by the way, I want to start by uh, sharing with you. And, and sometimes if I come across a really interesting book, or a very interesting website, I, I will share with you as well. Okay, so this is a, a good forum to do that. Um, I want to just share with you um, for this week. So there was a piece of news that caught my eye. Um, did you guys hear about HSBC? That 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 FX trader. You know the piece of news I'm referring to. Okay, now uh, I think around two days ago, and this was just this week, there was a headline in uh, Financial Times and other newspapers regarding a trader from HSBC uh, who was found guilty of fraud. And this guy, I think he is I think he's British, uh, so he, he lives in the UK. Uh, he doesn't work there anymore. Okay? Now the case I found quite interesting. Um, so this is a guy, and what apparently happened was, uh, he might have been working out of New York at the time, I, I'm not sure, but um, the name is Mark Johnson, and he was, uh, HSBC was helping a client, uh, which is an American company, and the, what is the name of the company? Did you guys, uh, did you guys see this piece of news? Uh, Kane, Kane Energy, C-A-I-R-N, Kane Energy, a UK oil and gas company, um, which hired HSBC to convert the proceeds of an asset sale from dollars to sterling. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this company, um, they, they sold an asset, an American asset, okay? So they, they sold the asset and they had cash in US dollars uh, and it was quite a lot of money um, and they wanted to sell US dollars back for pounds, okay? And um, I think the, the size of the transaction was around 3 billion, yeah, 5.3, no, 3.5 billion dollars. Okay, now, you might think that's a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, okay? Uh, but the FX market, the daily volume, and I have said this to you before, is actually around five trillion dollars. So if you look at that, um, then three billion 
Now you know you know five trillion, right? Five trillion is five followed by I don't even know how many zeros. Okay, twelve I think. One, two, three, four, five trillion dollars. Okay, it's the daily turnover in the FX market. It's absolutely huge. And then this client wanted to sell three and a half billion dollars for pound. So like I said, of course, it's a lot of money, but in the greater scheme of things, it is not even 0.1%, is it, of the daily, daily volume. 0.1% would be 5.3 billion, yeah? This is, so it's actually tiny, and I was surprised to, uh, to see this case, and what I mean by that is, um, do, you know what, do you know what this guy is guilty of? So it brings out some quite interesting issues. Um, now, there's a practice, I shouldn't be doing this is for Chinese equity. I'll do it elsewhere. I'll do it um, CUHK General Notebook. Um, there's a practice out there which is called front running. Have you ever heard of the term? You know what front running means? It's um, so traders would know, or and also fund managers. Does anyone know what front running means? By the way, you are free to to, to make comments or talk or, or chat. It makes it more interesting. Um, yeah, front running? Is if you are a broker or you are a trader and you know that your client is about to do a big trade, let's say you're, you, you are, your client is uh, Fidelity Asset Management and they told you confidentially that they want to buy $1 billion of stocks let's say in Microsoft, okay, and you take that information and quietly and secretly you put on a trade of your own for your own account or for your company's account, okay, that's called front running. There's another term which is not so polite, it's called rat trade, okay. You know what a rat is, right? Um, well, a rat is, I don't know, it might be in the same family as a mouse, right? but mouse, there's Mickey Mouse, there's no Mickey rat. Right? Uh, rats are supposed to be quite unpleasant. Um, so a rat trade is when you, you basically, you cheat on your client. And um, uh, technically, this is illegal. Okay? Um, but the reason it's illegal, I think it's interesting. Uh, in fact, front running can be legal um, if, you, if you know a little bit about high frequency trading, okay? Uh, now, what is high frequency trading? High frequency trading is when uh, those funds out there, they look at the, what, what orders uh, investors generally have put into the system. And these actually you, uh, are for everyone to see. So this, you, you can see uh, if they disclose it, okay? So you can see whether there are a lot of buy orders or whether there are a lot of sell orders at what price and so on. And high frequency traders try to take advantage of what may happen by figuring out, you know, the possible pattern of prices, if it sinks to a certain level or, or if it rises above a certain level. Now, technically, then you are 
you are standing in front of someone in order to try to benefit, even though they may or may not be your client. Okay, so if they can be your client, they may not. Um, the difference between between high frequency trading and something like this with HSBC is that um, HSBC was dealing with a customer and no one else knows that information except HSBC, okay? Whereas with high frequency trading, uh, sometimes you write extremely complicated programs and you try to figure out whether the, you know, the, the, the share price is, is likely to go in a certain direction, uh, purely based on what orders are out there. But it is also standing in front of somebody, just like here. You see what I'm saying? Yeah? But, um, so this guy was found, and the curious thing was, um, he was um, extradited to the United States, and he was tried in a court in New York. So I suspect the offense was probably committed uh, in, in, in the United States. And um, a lot of traders are probably getting quite nervous. Um, and the, the defense lawyer said they have convicted an innocent man and they claim that this is actually quite widespread practice. Now, there are really quite interesting issues in there because, uh, well, issue number one I, I found surprising was that if you, if the market as a whole, if every day the transaction volume is $5.3 trillion, then it just makes me wonder whether a three and a half billion dollar transaction really can push the market around. That was my, my, my first reaction, even though it's a lot of money, but the market is even bigger. Okay, so the idea of front running is, you know, in this case, you've got a planet and they have dollars. They need to sell dollars to buy sterling and by doing that, by, by, by that action alone, you would think that the, the price of sterling may actually, you know, starts to rise, at least temporarily, you know, for a couple of days. And what you do is, you try to get in there, and you buy sterling first. And not for your client. Okay, so that, that's front running. Yeah. And the problem is, like I said, because uh, because nobody else knows that, and it's confidential information between you and your customer, so technically, that is kind of insider trading. Okay. Um, but like I said, um, it is actually quite hard to push the FX market around because it is so big. So I'm surprised they actually even tried that. Uh, and in fact, if you read the news article, um, they are supposed to have made uh, $7 million. I think $7 million. Yeah. Um, so they said he orchestrated, so this is the trader, a scheme to deal for HSBC before trading on behalf of the client tipping off colleagues through code phrases such as my watch is off and netting an illicit, which is to say, you know, illegal profit of more than $7 million. I, I suppose in the end, if you, if you trade in the FX market and you suddenly trade a big volume within a very short time, uh, then, yes, you probably can push the market up that way, okay? Even though this is this is tiny compared to the, the daily turnover. And they actually, um, uh, I think part of the evidence against this guy was, 
a record of telephone calls that he was making um, and in one phone call um, the uh, so in, in another situation actually the price of sterling was getting more and more expensive so of course this is this is after they they traded i assume okay after the trader traded for their own account and the price of sterling kept going up uh, and then the client was getting nervous so in the end the client decided to sell all the dollars and just buy sterling in one in one big parcel uh, and of course then then the trader would make a lot of money and there's a tape recording of the trader when someone told him this news that the client decided to to just sell all the dollars in one big in one big parcel in one big trade and his reaction was oh effing christmas now you you know what that means right so for in the western world when when it's christmas time it's it's like it's like chinese new year for us okay ah xin nian lai la okay so we're so happy it's, it's, it's happy time it's bonus time it's pre it's time for presents it's time for a treat so when he heard that news he said oh happy christmas and and actually you hear that um I'll play this to you. This was when this was when someone called the trader and told him that the client is I mean in the end you act on the client's instructions but the client decided to sell all the dollars three and a half billion maybe less uh, to buy sterling right away because the, the price is the price is climbing up and he said F in Christmas did you hear that just now right um, now there, there are interesting issues um, you know whether he was well I let, let me let me give you two pieces of advice okay um, so some of you one day uh, you will you will end up you will end up working in very sensitive areas in finance whether you are buy side or sell side and, um, and my advice to you is whenever you are in a position to take advantage of confidential information please don't do it Please don't do that. Okay. It's not a joke. Um, people will be jailed for that. And, um, and you know, you, you might be an analyst, and you might be a really hot analyst, and uh, or you have confidential information because you're working in high banking. You know company A is about to take over company B. Now that's very, very sensitive information. And if you think you can tell your, your uncle and auntie or Boyfriend, girlfriend, and go and buy some stocks. Okay. It's not that simple. Okay. Uh, likewise, for this guy here, okay. so um, he was called on the tape. So that, that's the first point. The second point also is related. Uh, actually, uh, when you are doing these deals, okay, all your phone conversations are recorded. And you know that anyway. Okay. And if 
you are uh, you are a fund manager, you are calling a broker, either if you have a recorder on your side, they will have one on their side anyway. Okay? When you bring up somebody and say, you know, I want to, I want to sell dollar buy yen at one hundred three eighty seven, whatever, okay? they call you a price, you say done. At that moment, it is legally binding. You can't. You can't go back five years later. I'm sorry, I changed my mind. Okay? That doesn't happen. Actually, legally, that is already a contract, and uh, and with, with, with legal consequences. So, so you are. Uh, so the phones. Just be careful of the phones. You know, and and uh, if there's something personal that you don't want people to know, uh, maybe you want to. You want to just go offline and go downstairs. Oh, I, I'll tell you one interesting case. Um, which happened to an alumni. Um, it's quite unfortunate. Um, and I think the moral of the story is that when you work in finance, you need to have very high standards of integrity, honesty. Not only that, not only you have to be clean, you have to be seen to be clean. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think two, two years ago, there was this guy, he was a really pretty good guy actually, he was a student there, and I remember he, he, uh, he was hard working. Attitude. So he was doing an internship in uh, one of the stock brokers, and uh, and there was a rule uh, saying that I think you you shouldn't use your handphone, you shouldn't use your mobile in the in even or something. So any communication that you have has to be through that line. And for him, that was, he, he couldn't get used to it. Oh, shit, I can't use my phone. So every now and again, he would take his phone and he would go downstairs to call somebody. Okay? And, um, and he was an intern at the time. And then his boss actually noticed, what is this guy doing? You know, every half an hour, he's going downstairs to make a phone call. And Actually, uh, he was asked to leave. I don't mean for a day, okay? His internship was terminated. Now, the guy is completely innocent. He was probably just going downstairs to call his girlfriend or his mom, okay? But the boss thought it looked suspicious. Why is he making a phone? He's, he's got some stock tips and he's going off somewhere to. to to, to, uh, to take out a decision or something. And then, in the end, um, actually, he, uh, he, he was not, uh, they, they let him go. So you just got to be careful, not only what, I mean, you may be innocent, and you know you are innocent, right? But in, in, in law, that's not enough. Okay? Uh, and you are innocent, but people see that maybe you have done something wrong. Okay? <laughs> That's really not good. Okay? You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, is there anything you guys want to ask me? Thank you for coming. Anything you want to ask me? Now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, is it a to use the phone to the information? If you use the phone, phone the phone. Oh, 
What, 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 do you, what do you mean? No, no, no. You mean, you mean the mobile phone? Yeah, but you can only use it once. I I don't know because I've never done that. Uh, but let me say this. Uh, first of all, I, I suspect you watch a lot of movies. <laughs> you can tell me which one they had their practice of. Okay, I think he's saying that you, you use a phone that cannot be traced to make uh, an insider trade. Uh, however, it is not simply the phone itself that I trace back to you, um, I can also trace what you said, and you said that to somebody else. So on the other side, there might be a record. But what's more important, even if I don't have your verbal instructions, okay, well, your trade has to go into some sort of account. Okay? Now, maybe, all right, you hide behind some account in Switzerland or the Bermuda. Yes, you can do that. You can go to the empty read. You try to hide it. I, I, I guess then, then you really have a very serious intent to cheat. Um, I, I think some of the, you know, as, as it is in any other criminal activity, quite often they find out because someone is reporting to the authorities. It is true. So yes, you may get away with it, okay? but quite often you are caught because somebody else is telling the uh, crime squad. Um, I don't think you you can expect to get away with it just by using a, a phone that you dispose of. No, I don't think it's that simple. Um, and I don't think you even get away with it if you, if you ask your, your mother uh, or, your, or your uncle to make a trade. If it was so simple, everyone would be doing it. Um, um, my advice to you is don't do it. Okay. Um, if you are if you are a good banker, then you should already be make, making enough money, a lot of money. Okay. So you don't really need to. Use that kind of avenue. Okay. Now, if you don't have any questions today, um, let me just go back to. So near the start of this term, I actually received some some questions from you guys, and I, I know we held a meeting when we talked about some of these, and. Um, uh, there were some which were outstanding, so I might try to tackle, and I think uh, uh, tackle the, the the remainder. And I think we got up to like student number six when uh, this this student asked me a question about U.S. Treasury. I answer that actually in one of the tutorials for investment and portfolio analysis. So I already answered this question, but. There are other ones, okay? So I can try to share a nothing, a nothing thing, oh, and, and another thing, I think. Another thing. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna take it up from there. Now, so number one, how much time do you spend reading news and books every day? Because, because you are very knowledgeable, and I, well, thank you for the compliment, and I want to become a person like you, I, and these two habits are very important uh, for us to acquire more knowledge and have new ideas. Uh, I would say, but for me, there's so much news every day, I don't know clearly which I should read in detail. 
and how I can read fast and have a clear idea of what happened in the financial market. Um, well, my advice is if you look at any, any website, and FT is an example, right away there's a market section. And you find that you know, all, the, all the good websites will have that. So if you go down to markets, if you go down to markets, you see there's a fast FT, or these are just blogs, overview is just a blog, and market data and capital markets. So that's probably a good place to start. And where you can often either get a summary, so well, here is not a summary. Hold on. But let's say you go to uh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg is probably a better example. Okay, uh, so you go to, you go to um, something like Bloomberg and you go to the market section. Uh, they will normally have a summary for you on what has happened. And in some websites like CNBC or Reuters, they like to give you a mini, mini summary of what's happened to the major bond and stock and currency markets all over the world. Um, uh, and there are a lot of websites that will, that will do that, okay? Now, that's, that's, that's one thing that I do. Now, that really shouldn't take you too long um, because I guess there are, there are, there are two types of material that I that I read on markets. So the first one is just to re, uh, refresh yourself what's what's happened in the market recently in the last couple of days. Now that is just reporting, that is just data. Okay. Now data is cheap uh, in this world what that we live in. Okay. So I tend to spend more time actually reading on people's opinions and that is the part that I find far more valuable okay it's all this analysis and so depending on what you are reading um, you should try to try to keep uh, keep yourself up to date you know with, with developments certainly in China or in Asia and and then also in, in, in the US as well Okay, so that's how that's how I would approach this. Um, now, what else? Are you guys actually? I, I'm just curious to know. So I was quite shocked to. I was uh, I was quite shocked to see the one survey. Um, University students. I'll tell you about that. Uh, they, will, they will ask these students uh, confidentially, uh, you know, how much time do you spend reading the newspaper every day? And the results that came back were quite shocking. Uh, in fact, most of them don't read newspapers. Okay, to start. This is not just for finance, but just, I think it was undergraduate uh, generally. So most of them don't even read newspapers. And I think maybe around 30% of them, 25, 30%, that's one in four, who spend, uh, let's say, half an hour a day. Which is not really a lot of time. Right? And then if, if for people who spend more than half an hour, it was even less than that. So when I saw those statistics, I was, I was not surprised, no wonder 
you know, this generation now, they're so ignorant of A, you know, things that are happening around them. B, why they don't seem to have any opinions. I, I'm not talking about you guys, okay? I think those are like Hong Kong, Hong Kong students. They don't seem to have much opinion on anything, okay? Um, I, I cannot emphasize, I really cannot emphasize the importance of uh, keeping yourself up to date with newspapers and uh, uh, articles and also, you know, reading books and so on. And that is, I think, one of the major factors that you are likely to get ahead when you are in front of an employer when you're a candidate. I'm quite often, uh, I, I get very impressed by, you know, what books people are reading. First of all, you want to be reading some books, okay? Um, and then you ask them and then they tell you, and it doesn't have to be in finance, okay? Maybe you're reading, a, you're reading a book about Jewish history, and, you know, if you're in an interview and they ask you, what books have you been reading? It's, it's actually a chance for you to demonstrate you know, your, your, wide, your wide range of interests. Um, but reading is, is very, very important, and especially reading on, on news. You can't talk to clients, you can't talk to managers unless you are aware of what is going on. Otherwise, you sound like an idiot. Okay? Um, and um, what was the other question? What history books of finance would you recommend since you mentioned history is significant? Um, well, I have not read many history books as such because I, I was I've been living in this world for in this world of finance for the last 25 years um, but if you if you are truly interested um, I can make some recommendations and a lot of these actually they are um, they are writers from my favorite newspaper um, so if you want to know what has happened uh, what, what happened in the financial crisis, uh, there's a journalist called um, Gillian Ted, who is quite good. Um, and she wrote a book a little earlier. Although this, this might be a little bit biased. So this one is called Fool's Gold. Um, how unrestrained greed corrupted a dream, shattered global markets and unleashed a catastrophe. Um, oh, she's even written a book called Structured Products. I wonder what she knows about structured products. It's $163. It's expensive. Um, is this a Japanese version? Uh, I don't know what books this is. Okay. Uh, uh, this must be about Japan. A Wall Street gamble to rescue Japan from its trillion dollar meltdown. Okay. Um, there's um, another writer that I that I am quite fond of. He's a guy called Michael Lewis. Have you heard of this guy? Now he's not, strictly speaking, uh, a, a historian of finance, uh, but he's written some very interesting books over the years. The most famous one is probably Liar's Poker. Now this one is quite old, and it talks about the time when he was a bond sales for an investment bank called Salomon Brothers. So this is going back at least 20 years. It's very funny. And um, I think this book and the movies 
that came along after that inspired a whole generation of investment bankers. Um, he's written another one called Flash Boys, uh, which is about high frequency trading. Um, Boomerang, so this is uh, regarding some countries that he visited just shortly before the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, Greece, uh, Iceland, I remember, there were some other ones. Um, the Big Short, so this one was about the, uh, the, the global financial crisis. This actually was made into a film, as you know. Who, who's actually seen that film? Okay. Um, another one I um, I can think of is uh, another another interesting book that I, I have I can remember is uh, by by Mervyn King. Do you know who Mervyn King is? And. When I, when I first um, got hold of this book, it, it made an impression on me. Uh, Mervyn King was the governor of the Bank of England uh, during the financial crisis. He, he's not anymore. And he wrote an interesting book called The End of Alchemy. Money banking and the future of global economies. I mean, you can see a lot of the books I recommend to you will at least be four and a half stars. Only the book is like that, okay, so don't take that for granted. That means, on average, people are doing either four stars or five stars, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and do you, do you know what alchemy is? Alchemy. It's a word for. Uh, th there is no such thing, but apparently in, in, in ancient times, people think that there are some ways you can turn uh, uh, anything into gold. And when you try to turn something into gold, it's called alchemy. Okay? I think that's... That's the word, okay? The medieval, this is a long time ago, the med medieval forerunner of chemistry concerned with the transmutation of matter, particularly attempts to convert base metals into gold or to find a universal ellipse. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, a seemingly magical process of transformation or creation. So uh, this book is interesting because it doesn't, just tell you, oh, what happened, what happened, what happened. We know what happened, and people get bored just getting told uh, what happened. But he tries to explain to you why things happen, or why there was there a crisis. And he made some suggestions about, you know, things that maybe we can try and do uh, to see if we can avoid that from happening. And I think a lot of the things he said in there, probably he couldn't say when he was governor for the Bank of England because of his position. So this is an interesting book. Um, what else? There, there, are, there are other ones that are um, Frank Portnoy. I think that's his name. The guy who wrote the book called Fiasco. Is that the name? I think that's his name. Um, oh, Partnoy. P A R T. P A R T. So he's also written some um, interesting books, including uh, Fiasco, which I asked some of you guys to read. So this one is about a guy who was in a, in a derivative sales desk in Morgan Stanley, 
he wrote another one called Infectious Greed, How to Seed and Risk Corrupted Financial Markets. Uh, if you want a history, I, I guess this one, this one comes close to it. Okay. When you are reading these books, my, my advice to you is that some of them can be quite biased, unfortunately. If you want to sell books, you have to be sensational. So just ask yourself all the time, okay, when I'm reading something, what are the facts and what are opinions? So absorb all the facts that you, know, you are free to form your own opinion. Okay. Um, okay, so I think if you really just want to know what happened, so if you ask about history books, if you just want to know what happened, maybe you don't even have to buy books, although some of these books are very entertaining, uh, but there's so much information already on the internet. Just choose your sources carefully. Okay, But all the all the books that I have recommended to you, I think they don't just give you a, a record of, of what happened, so they try to tell you something more interesting. Okay, this one certainly does. All right. Um, okay, so question number three, I'm sorry this is a little bit dated. Um, so this question is about making investment decisions. Recently, prices of metal are increasing due to tighter supply, better economic growth, which needs metal for infrastructure and lower dollars, which make metal affordable. So many investors are crowding into this market and the prices seem to be increasing in the near future. But at the same time, I heard someone said that when the whole world gets crowded into one trade, it typically ends in tears. So as a fund manager before, what do you usually do under situations like this? Would you short or long for more gains or fewer losses and why? Well, that's a that's a long that's a big question. Um, I I think with any kind of investments, um, it's, it is always the case that the majority of or the minority of people are making the majority of the money. This has got nothing to do with social justice or equality. It's just, I think, human nature. We tend to sort of, you know, follow uh, the herd, and most traders actually end up losing money. Okay, or most most investors. And um, I think if you want, if you really want to make money, you you have to you have to go to places that other people. Going. That's the way to make money. Now, for this specific question, uh, so you are you have a, a view on the metal market. Should you go in? Um, I, I think it depends. It's, it's very hypothetical. Um, one, I think it depends on your time frame. Okay, what is your investment horizon? If your investment horizon that, that's the starting point. Okay? If your investment horizon is, is a one month horizon, uh, sorry, let's say one year horizon, and the metals market has been rallying for one month, yeah, probably you will go in there. Okay? Because uh, your your holding period is much longer than you know what, what has happened currently. Um, but if your investment horizon is shorter than that, and the price increases have already happened for a long time, then then no, I think you are late. Okay. And um, you you should not do that, do do anything just because everyone else is doing. Um, 
that's what it means to be a contrarian. Okay, is you you try to think in in a different way. Okay. Um, would you short or long for more gains or fewer losses? I think without the the actual exact situation, it's, it's hard to say. Um, if you uh, uh, give, give, give you an example, okay. If you if the market has, if you think in the long run, you know it has a a, a, long, a long way to go, and you are here. Okay? But if you look, if you were to magnify this part, and it, it looks like it's gone up a lot, uh, it has to go back a bit. It has to pull back before it can it can go further up. That's normally how markets work. So if you were here and your time frame was very short, then yes, you can try to sell it if you are confident enough. Okay? Even though the, the long term trend might be against you. Okay? So think, things like that you have to you have to take into account. Okay. Um, Yeah, that's that's how that's what I would do. Okay. Now, um, so there's a student seven and student eight. Now, I will uh, I will answer some of these other questions, but if there's something that you you want to know, feel free to write to me. Okay. If you see something, uh, I'll I'll give you some examples. If you if you read the, the thing that most often happens is you read a report uh, in Bloomberg or CNBC and there's a certain part that you don't understand. Feel free to send me the report, okay, and we can discuss it here. Okay? But otherwise, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go for today. Okay, and if you want to, uh, if you have time to come along next week. Uh, I will show you some other interesting stuff. I what I what I would probably do is uh, I will answer these questions or any questions you might have, and then each week I will try to show you something which is interesting, like uh, a new website or a, a a book that I've been reading, uh, or you know a trading trading strategy or something. Okay. Does anyone want to ask me something? Yeah. The asset management department in a bank, you mean? Um, okay, I understand the question. Um, okay, now banks, as you know, so the banks out there where their core competence is borrowing. That's commercial banks. Uh, but they can also do IPOs and bonds, plans and trade. Um, and they also they, they can get involved in insurance. Yeah. So banks actually uh, they, they get involved in different aspects of capital markets. And asset management is just one other area that they do. You need to go? Okay. Is there anything happening to you at 1230? Okay, so normally I might want to try and do this in one hour or less, okay. Um, so asset management is just another department. So an example would be uh, HSBC. 
So HSBC has an asset management unit, uh, or JP Morgan. Okay. Now I think in in theory, and in fact even in practice, um, these asset management subsidiaries have not much relationship uh, with the bank itself. I know that because I used to work with the fund manager in Australia, and the bank is called Westcap, which is owned by the biggest banks in Australia, and it was Westpac Investment Management. So this was the investment management arm of a bank. Okay, it's just one of the many businesses a bank might have. Okay, um, it tends not to have a lot of interaction uh, with the uh, with the bank itself. For example, okay, if uh, you are UBS asset management, okay, and there is UBS, the, the bank itself, so they have a big investment banking division, okay, so traditionally, the, the bank would just treat this as a client, just like any other client, and UBS asset management would treat UBS as a service provider, just like they would treat Goldman Sachs or, or Deutsche Bank. Um, it's not good for for the bank to have a very cozy and friendly relationship with the asset manager. I think for all kinds of compliance and ethical reasons, you don't want people to see, ah, those two are very friendly. Um, then, uh, because one is a buy side and the other is a sell side, okay? So they potentially can share a lot of information. So the bank can tell, can tell the asset manager about all the all, what all the all the other clients are doing, okay, and then the asset manager can tell the bank, oh, you know, Morgan Stanley is 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 doing this in this deal. Oh, Goldman Sachs is doing their research in that and that way. So you don't want that to happen. So they are really just like a, a separate unit inside a bank. I don't know if that's is that what you were thinking of the question, yeah. Um, so. You know, the HSBC asset management or UBS or JP Morgan, in fact, I've just named probably the big, the biggest three in town. Uh, they, they, they are just, just like, you know, Fidelity or Templeton. But those guys are specialized just, you know, in, in as doing asset management itself. Okay. Somebody else wants to say something? Anyone else? Don't be shy, uh, this is what I'm here for. Unless I'm keeping you from, from lunch. Um, so what I'll do is, um, like I said, you know, next time I will show you some, some pretty, some cool websites and I will answer your questions. But if you send them to me first, okay, it's likely that I can provide you a lot more information. All right. Um, so if you guys are okay with that, and um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. Do you mind if I keep a record on who was here? It's just for my own record. I'll give you a piece of paper. Who just left? No. Don't worry, I'm not gonna. It's not for participation or anything. I just want to know who came. That's all. All right. Uh, thank you for coming, and um, I hope that is useful for you. So, like I said, anything you want to know, just uh, write to me and uh, and ask me. Okay. Thanks everyone. It's, uh, your attendance is appreciated. <laughs>